I think you'll find the same frank and openness from, from our next speaker, Mac McCurry from uh, Second ID, DCG in Korea. So we're gonna go about halfway around the world and let him talk to us about what he's facing over there today. So Mac, over to you, brother. All right, I know everybody is uh, post-lunch, so we're gonna wake up with a little video. Go ahead and cue it up. They've gotta be ready all the time. So they can't be, they can't be just on idle. They've gotta be second to none at any time. I am the eye of the storm inside. I am silent and strong, just waiting for the right, right moment to strike. Crawl you like a gold rock. So those of you who know me know that uh, I came from uh, G8 FDV. Last couple of times I spoke up here, so you know, I'm just happy not to be talking modernization today. <laughs> hey, uh, disclaimer up front. So uh, everybody knows uh, a lot of di diplomatic actions going on right now, so I will steer clear and stay, uh, unlike my partner who was, who was more strategic in his comments there in Europe, I'm gonna stay focused on Army aviation and the things we're doing on the pen and, and uh, let the diplomatic uh, work sort itself out. I'd like to uh, thank General Munt and Quad A for letting me come talk today, uh, take a little uh, time uh, off the pen and get uh, re-blued on Army Aviation here. And uh, proud to be here representing the 28,500 or so service members plus family members that are forward deployed on Freedom's Frontier in the Republic of Korea.
So this day in history, 1953, Battle of Pork Chop Hill, okay? Formerly known as, uh, as Hill 255, uh, made famous by a movie in 1959 by that title, Pork Chop Hill. Uh, this picture reminds us uh, of the brutality of the Korean War uh, and that we're still serving under an armistice. Next slide. Okay, many of you may have served in Korea in the past, uh, but today I want to provide a little context on what's changed, uh, what's the same, highlight some uh, priorities, some opportunities there on the pen, and encourage green suitors in the audience to uh, consider serving in Korea. Throughout what you'll hear is our forces in Korea are, are nested with the defense strategy. You'll hear me talk about things we're doing to build a more lethal aviation force. You'll hear me talk a lot about the alliance and you'll see a little bit of reform in there. It's been a while since we were able to send the DCG uh, back to Quad A. Uh, due to the uh, tensions on the pen in the last couple of years, I'm the first one to come back in I think three years. And it, we had all hands on deck prior to that, prior to fall of 2017's uh, nuclear test and missile launches. That's the last one, by the way. Uh, tensions were high and they've been easing as we moved into 2018 and, and up to today. So after the 2018 Winter Olympics and uh, the Panmunjom meeting between President Moon Jae-in and the North Korean leader came a renewed effort uh, towards lasting peace. Tensions decreased further uh, following the historic Singapore summit uh, last summer. And we undertook some efforts in the, uh, in, in the JSA. And inside the JSA, you had United Nations Command do, uh, running some uh, combined operations there with the North Koreans uh, to, on some demining. And I was privileged to be present last July when we returned 55 sets of human remains from some of our United Nations heroes from the Korean conflict. With the 1 November implementation of the Comprehensive Military Agreement between the two Koreas, uh, we, that, they implemented some measures to help further reduce accidental encounters. And most recently, as you know, we had the summit in Hanoi. Uh, so lots of changes in strategic landscape over the years. Uh, we add that to transformation on the pen. So we now have Camp Humphreys as the largest army installation outside the United States with the USFK 8th Army and 2ID headquarters all located there. Uh, that's a big change from years past being, being in Yongsan and, and Red Cloud. Uh, so this has been a dynamic uh, year and a half to be sure. Earlier this year, uh, General Abrams captured all of that change when he, when he said to Congress, conditions for the development and sustainment of combat readiness on the pen have changed. Uh, and I think this certainly applies to Army aviation. I'll show you why on this slide. Uh, so with the myriad of changes, strategically, transformation-wise, this is not your father's Korea. However, much remains the same. The mission is constant. The alliance is strong. We're still there to deter aggression and maintain peace on the peninsula and be ready if that should not happen. As you saw in the video, Army Aviation remains critical and indispensable part of the 2nd Infantry Division and all combined arms on the Korean Peninsula. Aviation units and assets remain ready and deeply integrated in all missions. We work and train with our ROC allies as we have for the entirety of the armistice. In 2ID, for instance, some of you that uh, have served in Korea in the past, you might notice my patch is slightly different than the historical 2ID uh, patch. I've got this uh, nice tab up on top of it that says Combined Division. And back in 2015, we undertook an effort to, co to uh, combine the division staff. In other words, we brought ROC Army officers and NCOs onto the division staff. Today, the, the 2nd Infantry Division has 87 uh, ROC Army officers and NCOs serving in the division brigade and battalion staffs throughout the division. That goes a long way to, to helping us understand each other, show common understanding of the mission and the uh, adversary, and to help us in, in training opportunities. In addition to that, we have our, our normal uh, contingent of Katusas that we've had integrated throughout the armistice. Back, please. So, back one slide, please. 
There you go, thank you. So for all the green suitors today, Korea remains a great place to serve. Training op tempo is high. Uh, flight hours, two cab, flown all their flight hours for the last three years, okay? No issue with flight hours in Korea. And this is what kind of what we look like north to south. So you see up there your, your, your traditional locations of, of Camp Casey, Camp Mobile. Uh, you look farther down to Camp Humphreys, Kunsan Air Force Base there, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second, and K-16. Uh, those are our traditional locations. And then you see our training facilities. So Rod Range, those of you who have been there in the past up north, our, our uh, Rodriguez Live Fire Complex, and then Bisung and Susung. Why is that important? So as we've seen continued urban sprawl, much as we have in the United States, Korean population's grown, lots, of, lots more high rises, lots more encroachment. There's been, uh, it gets harder and harder to find ranges. And so the beauty of having that combined staff in 2ID is our rock officers on our staff help integrate us and we use places like Bisong and Susong range for aerial gunnery now, in addition to some of our overwater locations. You see two cabs, uh, line of block chart up there in the top and, and third MI down in the bottom. So that's where the predominance of the assets are uh, in Korea for, for eight Army aviation. And you'll see some of the mission sets we're doing there. The lower right though is really critical for us. Modernization is the cornerstone of two, two cab right now. So about a year ago, we brought Gray Eagles onto the peninsula and two cabs been working hard to field the Gray Eagle company. We just brought the first Echo model, H64 Echo model equipped HARS onto the pen with 4.6 cab out of, out of 16th cab. And as you look forward there, we also swapped out our Chinook fleet. So all multi-year twos swapped out last fall uh, in two cab. And so you look forward there and you say, see HH60, UH60 Mike. So yes, believe it or not, we have all Lima models in Korea still. So this, this, uh, we get to the end of this summer and all those get, get swapped out with Mike models and they'll continue that, uh, that fielding into the fall. So fully modernized, able to employ against the full set of missions there in Korea. Next, please. Okay, as far as challenges and opportunities, so uh, Korea, one year, one year smaller tours, right? We've had over the years, historically, and that's always been a challenge for us on specialty manning. So when you have instructor operators for unmanned systems, or you have SIs and FIs in the back of our, our utility platforms, those are tough for us to maintain on short tours. The good news is with the expansion of Camp Humphreys down in Area 3, we have more command sponsored tours available. So green suitors, you want to come to Korea, sign up. It's a great place to be. Gray Eagles, we're looking forward to finishing out our complete uh, complement of Gray Eagles there in our Gray Eagle company. And then we look at overwater operations. So as you, you know, uh, Republic of Korea, fairly small landmass surrounded on three sides by water with the uh, MDL to the north. So the importance of overwater operations can't be overstated. Uh, 1,499 miles of coastline in the Republic of Korea. And so as we look at uh, capabilities, you know, to navigate, to do the find stuff portion of our mission, uh, that's important to us. Talk about uh, mega cities. As we, as we look at uh, future operating environments, you hear a lot about mega cities. Well, I certainly think Seoul would qualify as a mega city. And some of the things we think about there that, that, that concern us are, you know, most of, our, most of our protection systems are designed to protect us from the ground up, not somebody sitting on top of a 25-story high-rise shooting down on a helicopter. So some of the things we start to think about uh, for future capabilities. Uh, mountain flying, you know, I describe the prototypical Korea flight day. Uh, a couple years ago, I was a uh, flying a Kiowa Warrior in, in Korea and took off at Camp Humphreys. It was about 45 degrees and just a little bit overcast, fairly nice day for, for early spring at Camp Humphreys. Flew up to Camp Stanley, you know, up around the, uh, up through Seoul doing the transition up to Camp Stanley, got some gas, took off north and we were flying the, uh, the buffer zone there. Uh, and. We get up there and all of a sudden I'm in a snowstorm, you know, visibility starts coming down, it's snowing, it's, it's bad. 
come around the corner there through a pass back towards the rod range, opens back up, get back to Camp Stanley. Now it's about, you know, 50 degrees and overcast again, gas up, fly back to Camp Humphreys and it's 70 degrees and sunny. So, you know, that, that is flying in Korea and that's the kind of thing that we have to, uh, to round out our young aviators as they come onto the pen. On UAS and MUM-T, you know, we, uh, I was on a panel up here yesterday on alliance operations and uh, when we're operating in someone else's country, as, as General Navalis alluded to, you know, we have to be able to operate under their rules. So spectrum management and frequency availability for flying unmanned systems is a challenge for us that we work through with our ROC allies all the time. And we're looking forward to getting all those gray eagles there to, uh, to be able to expand our, our manned, unmanned teaming. Uh, airspace deconfliction, uh, as you all know over there in Korea, Artillery-based fight, you know, if, if, if something goes bad, it's probably going to be artillery-based fight to start, and so airspace deconfliction for our airframes uh, flying up there in the, in the northern part of the Republic of Korea uh, is a concern for us as well. And then we talk about contested environment, and you talk about our concept of penetrate, disintegrate, you know, rap rapidly converge to, to penetrate and disintegrate to return to competition. Uh, you know, I can't think of a more contested defense than one that's been prepared for 60 years. So we think about what, it, what that would be like to operate on that kind of concept as we look forward uh, into future concepts. Next slide. So uh, in closing, you know, the future path may be uncertain. I started out telling you where we'd been in the last three years uh, with, with the, the scale of tensions, but the constancy of mission and the rock-solid alliance remain the hallmarks of operations in Korea. Uh, thank you, and uh, kachi kachi da, we go together. We got time for questions? Sure. A couple questions, if you have any questions. Here's one right here. Hi, sir. Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Hey, Sydney. Uh, I'll ask you to uh, provide the compliment to your European colleague. You know, what's the threat picture? I'm, I'm a reporter. We often fixate on you know, the latest, uh, well, resurrected Soviet missile technology that turns into something with a fancy Korean name. Uh, but you know, what is their whole integrated capability in, uh, in North Korea? You know, they've got a lot of artillery, a lot of special operations. I mean, do they have, they're not the paradigm, the driving force for multi-domain, but they certainly have a form of anti-access area denial. So what's, your, what's sort of that enemy picture, obviously in unclassed terms, and how do we break, break their system open? If we have to, God, help, God willing, we don't. So we're, we're there, you know, we're first there to deter. If deterrence fails, we're there to return us to the armistice. So we're, you know, that's the mode we're in. As far as threats, uh, you stated the long-range artillery threat is certainly one that, that uh, we look at. Uh, you look at the, uh, the ability, I just talked about 1,499 miles of coastlines. There's obviously, uh, you got to have a way to, to uh, be able to do some of our aviation functions there, right? We talk about being able to find stuff, uh, kill stuff and move stuff. So that's the find stuff piece is how do you, how do, you do that? And that gets to that overwater operations piece. Uh, that we look at, um, but that, you know, we have a rock ally that, own, that this is their country. We're there to uh, integrate with them and, and return to armistice, so that's where, we're, where our focus is. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, I'm with uh, BA Systems. name is David Park. I spent some time in Korea. The uh, condition-based uh, condition opcon transition, uh, one of the things that we would probably want to look at is ROC Army's aviation capability. How do you uh, see that compared to what you have in, uh, in the pen and how they're growing and maybe uh, advancing, hopefully in the future, to take over? Yeah, so I'll stick to the aviation capability part of that question. So, uh, you know, I've got uh, Ryan, raise your hand. I've got Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Moore back here, Deputy Commander of uh, 2nd Cab here and uh, CW5, Mike Zanders is running around somewhere way in the back back there. So uh, we have the Army Aviation Operational Command, part of, that's part of the ROC Army that, that has helicopters and those units uh, routinely exchange information and, and, and do flight missions together. I will tell you that uh, the AAOC 
units had Echo Model Apaches on the pen before we did. Uh, so you know, that it's, not, uh, it's, it's not an antiquated force. Now when we talk about interoperability, that's something we, we try to talk about all the time and work on and, and you know, common comms and things like that are more difficult uh, depending on which aircraft we're talking about. But uh, they have a two-star general, Major General He is in charge of the uh, AAOC and uh, he's very focused on uh, sharing TTPs for training and, and everything else we can do to develop capabilities. Hi, Jen. Um, I wanted to ask, the administration has said that they don't want to do any more large-scale exer exercises on the Korean Peninsula. So what is the impact to Army Aviation specifically not being able to participate in some of those things? And um, are there other things you can do to sort of uh, increase your readiness or keep your readiness up? Yeah, so to stay at my level in the division, just focused on aviation readiness and exercises, uh, we are still proficient and trained in our aviation combined arms tasks. We focus on doing that uh, with the rotational brigade uh, that we have there on the pen, you know, currently the, the, th the uh, third brigade first armor division is there and we, we train on those tasks every day. So uh, at our level, in, down inside the, the battalions, I see us as, as still trained and ready. Hey Rod. Hey General, thanks a lot for your break. Can you talk, just to touch a little bit on that, what are we doing in terms of uh, virtual reality or any of those types of things to try to reduce the amount of time it takes uh, soldiers transitioning in and out to rotate and things like that, get up to speed with uh, the Rock Army and things of that nature. Yeah, I would say uh, not a lot of virtual reality training going on on the pen, a lot of reality training going on on the pen. Uh, uh, you know, we've got our standard complement of simulations and, and AVCAT and, and aircraft simulators there at, at Camp Humphreys uh, that we operate on and use that routinely. Uh, especially when we can uh, link it with ground training. Uh, but as far as uh, virtual reality, AI type things, we're not, you know, I haven't seen a lot of that come on the pen yet for, for those training. Mike, am I right? <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions out there? Oh, I think we're about done. Whoa, 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 hold on. No, that's not a question. You're waiting. He's trying to get somebody's attention over there. I saw him. He was trying to get somebody to bring him some popcorn. That's not a question. <laughs> uh, General McCurry, thank you again for your comments. As you all know, uh, the, the things we're asking our aviation leaders to do these days are pretty challenging uh, politically and, and, and operationally. And, and for you to take time to come and be with us today and give us that overview, it's refreshing. Thank you very much.